It's Tuesday the 3rd of September and we started our walk to the castle with a little trip to the playground. Obviously Maisie very keen on that sort of thing. Seesaw Pickerings. We're on our way up to Scarborough Castle and we've just got as far as uh, the top of the castle dike here on this side. This is the north side, that's Scobie Mills in the, in the distance, that's the Sea Life Centre, the white buildings, the white bridge as you can see. Normally we go there but we haven't been there this time yet. Over there is the Sands Complex I think they call it, which is where the Corner Cafe used to be. It's now all residential. See the tide is out again. We're it's sort of a bit after lunch it is, after lunch time, so I'm just looking towards the main drive and then there's the castle headland and the castle. We're just going to go up this road now. This is St Mary's Church, just on the on the way up to the castle, castle road. This is the church where my brother and various other family members have got married. On the way up to the castle, in one of the parts of the graveyard attached to St Mary's Church, to have some, uh, some sandwiches with the fantastic view of the of the bay there, across at the spa, one of the areas that we've been walking in recently. And um, this particular part of the graveyard is quite famous because it's the resting place of at least one of the Bronte sisters. This is the headstone for Anne Bronte, who wrote Agnes Hall, Agnes Gray, sorry, and the tenant of Walthill Hall and a lot of poetry. Um, she's died in 1849 and was buried here. So we finally arrived at Scarborough Castle, another English heritage site. Let's go in and have a look. Scarborough Castle, fortified site since the 12th century and last used defensively in 1745. We're inside Scarborough Castle now, we've come in through the main gate and we're just having a little look. We've got an audio tour as usual to tell us something about the history of the place. It's quite a historic site, it's been a settlement here on this headland where the castle is now for 3,000 years or more. There was a Bronze Age settlement, there was a Roman signal station on the top of the hill, there was a um, Viking settlement here and in the in the town below there was at first a Viking town which was destroyed in 1066 when Harold Hardrada invaded and then a little bit later the castle was built and it was a site of a big medieval siege. It's been an important castle for many many years, even recently in the First World War it was bombarded uh, by the Germans, it was from the sea. castle against the parliamentarians and it was bombarded by the par parliamentarians and this is when it was split in half as it is now so it was a full keep before then and they bombarded it and it fell and there were 20 men on the top when it fell and all but two of them managed to scramble to the other side before the walls finally succumbed in the end the castle didn't fall it was impregnable and they managed to beat up the attackers over and over again uh, but eventually, even though they had enough corn, but they didn't have any enough manpower to mill the corn and they also started to run out of water. The well uh, not being sufficient to the task of uh, keeping enough water for the men, never mind the horses, so the horses started to die. And then when they got down to about 22 men, Sir Hugh decided to surrender and they had to dismantle part of the wall at the front so that they could march out with full military honours after surrendering to the parliamentarian. You see there's a little timeline down here. This is the headland showing the rough orientation of the headland through history. So here, first occupation of the headland in 800 BC, which was during the Bronze Age, and the second settlement around about 500 BC, and then settled throughout the Roman period. And then there's a Roman signal station here about 400 AD, just before the Romans left Britain. 
and then the first Viking settlement in about a thousand AD and then Scarborough Castle founded in sort of the, the way it is now about 1138 and then the Civil War siege in 1645 that we just heard about then the new barracks built in 1746 and then Scarborough Castle was attacked by the German fleet in 1914 they were showing a little bit of information about the naming of Scarborough probably derived it from the Old, no Old Norse meaning the stronghold of Scarthy or Scardi um, and uh, as I was told when I was a kid this means the man with the hair lip it was a nickname of a 10th century Viking raider called Thorgils cool. 3D model in bronze of the headland, the castle headland showing the different structures the entrance and the keep and the king's hall that's number six and then the Roman signal station which is this thing here on the edge of the cliff a lot of this coastline has been lost due to erosion in the last 3,000 years, so it's not quite how it used to be in the day. Giving some details of the keep built between 1158 and 1164 by order of the King Henry II. It had a basement and three floors above, and its angles were carried up to the turrets to a total height of about 100 feet. The west wall being demolished by order of Parliament in 1649. This side, the non demolished side, still pretty intact. as you can hear. So this is the view from the, as far up into the King's Keep as you can get these days, looking right down into Scarborough. The sun's come out so it looks pretty cool. That's pretty cool. And then the King's Keep, the detail that you can see in here, these two fireplaces here, and here were identical, which were lined with terracotta or tiles to throw the heat back into the room. These windows here, either side of the great fireplace, would have been detailed like the ones above. In the past, these ones have still got their detailing. I don't know if it's very easy to see it on the thing. This entire hall was separated by this arch. So there's a big arch that kept the, the castle up whilst having this big open room on the bottom. And then this staircase up here led up to uh, a little chapel above the entrance and then looking down over the railing you're looking into what would have been the basement and this helical staircase went the entire height of the castle and uh, gave entry to every single room in the keep. This plaque here showing a reconstruction of what they think the keep looked like. You can see that the at this stage it got much too windy to hear what I was actually saying, so sorry about that. All I was saying was that the entry into the keep was really on the first floor by those steps that you can see to the right that I went up a little bit earlier. Um, so everybody came in that way, there was no entrance on the ground floor or into the basement direct. And then you'd get through to the other floors using that spiral staircase in the wall that's been demolished, it was demolished during the Civil War. Then the first chamber being the King's Chamber, or the, the, the first floor, King, the public room essentially, and then the next floor up. King's private apartments were, and then it looks from the outside like the keep has an extra story so you can see the windows at the very top there but those windows just look out onto the roof and the high walls just protect the roof from uh, bombardment well 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 it's the well again a little distance away from this keep this presumably was the well that almost ran dry during the civil war siege and from the King's Keep a little bit this is I'm not sure if this is a guard tower or something the structure that we're in here some kind of building built into the wall and this structure here is a garderobe or a toilet so you can sit on this area here and do your business and it will just go straight out over the castle walls down onto the invaders or whoever was below there this is the remains of the Great Hall which is positioned in the outer bailey, in the outer defensive area. 
whereas the King's Keep is still within the inner bailey. It wasn't unusual for castles and great houses at this time to be split in terms of function. So the public area here, where everybody would meet and eat and public business would be conducted more often than in the keep. Um, and then the King's private chambers were inside the actual King's Keep itself and then that was also clearly the last line of defense should a siege happen which it did in the civil war and everybody ended up in the keep the illustration here shows king john's chamber block which was built in the early 13th century and this is what remains of it now again the, the light is in exactly the wrong position for this i'm not quite sure how easy it is to see this was further modified in the um in the late 19th century um, into this structure here and king john during his time spent more on Scarborough Castle than he did on any other castle in the kingdom. So a little bit more detail of King John's chamber block. So heading out of King John's chamber block and heading down the side of the castle wall, the outer bailey wall. This little photograph is showing uh, King John's curtain wall that we've just come along with the south steel battery on the right below the castle. You can't get access to that now because the whole cliff area is unstable and there was this tower, this Cockhill Tower, which essentially stood on the end of the wall which has been, which fell into the sea, I don't know, 17 something or other, I can't remember exactly what they said. And um, this little access point down here is the sally port which gets gives access to the battery but it's all boarded up these days this ditch and these ruins here are probably from a later period this is roughly the position of the roman signal station relative to the king's keep just on the other side of where the roman signal station was there's a well not as deep as the one in the main keep and this is the site of saint mary's chapel it's all walled off you can't get in there and this was built about a thousand AD and rebuilt in the 12th century and again in the 14th century and it stands in the ruins of the Roman signal station from about 400 AD or 370 AD they're saying here to give warning for of Anglo-Saxon raiders and before that there's evidence of Bronze Age and Iron Age settlements dating back as far as 800 BC. It's an illustration which shows a reconstruction of what they think the Roman signal station may have looked like built of stone and a tower with a light at the top but which was covered most of the time and then one they wanted to send a signal up and down the coast so you can see the headlands on the coast further down towards the south and similarly towards the north um, they could send essentially semaphore or like Morse code like signals by flashing the light covering it and uncovering it at different uh, different patterns this illustration is uh, a guess at what the Bronze Age settlement might have looked like on the headland um, it's very difficult to tell now that the cliff went out about 100 metres into the sea further than it does now so they reckon that some of that might have been lost so but well, they have done excavations and they have found that that there were storage pits for food and various things up here so whether it was a permanent settlement or whether it was a temporary settlement they did use this as a food storage area um, and uh, this site now is actually still quite important it's a special a site of special scientific interest and they have up to believe it or not this is quite amazing five different species of grass on this castle headland making it one of the more important um, natural environments uh, owned by English heritage in the region. The girls are at the world famous harbour bar in Scarborough. This is 1950s style milk bar serving all kinds of yummy goodness. You can get sandwiches and milkshakes and sodas and all kinds of things. I'm having a coke float. So just, thank you very much. Eating the Nick of Glory. My dad's got his strawberry milkshake. Rosie's got her chocolatina. Our mum has got her coffee. And that's my the remnants of my coke float.